Did you know I'm making my own trading card game based on cryptids? Go to cryptidcardgame.com and enter your email address to be notified the moment pre-orders open. And you can even get a look at the rulebook early. My apologies for the shorter than usual episode. I've been having difficulty getting back into the groove between Christmas and New Year's. But today, I've got some haunted house stories to share with you, because we haven't done that topic in a while. So prepare to experience dark spirits crawling across your bedroom floor and demons that will never let you sleep peacefully again. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. And please suggest in the comments some future topics you want to hear to help me plan the start of 2023. Thank you. Now, let's begin. A Night in a Haunted House From Pleasant Peasant This story isn't mine, but my teacher's father's. He truly believes it is a demonic encounter, and I do as well. This man, who we'll call Dave, lived in California and loved baseball. On the first day of school that year, Dave noticed that there was a new and shy kid standing by himself. Dave was a 15-year-old student at the time and decided to be nice to him. He walked up and asked, Hey, you like baseball? He had noticed that the kid, named Ed, was wearing a faded Orioles cap. Dave described Ed as looking sickly, having shadows under his baggy eyes and pale skin. Ed said yes, and they went on to play baseball after school. Dave noticed that Ed was always asking him and other people if he could come over to spend the night or come over to have dinner. This intrigued him. After months of playing baseball after school with Ed, Dave asked him, Hey, why are you afraid to go home? He was thinking that maybe his dad beat him or something along those lines. Ed replied, Promise you won't laugh at me, but my house is haunted. My mom's a flight attendant and my dad is in the Marines, so they're rarely home. Dave, being a 15-year-old male who was living in the 60s watching Creature Double Features, asked, Can I come spend the night? Ed agreed to him coming over the following night, which was a Friday. After baseball the next day, Dave and Ed walked to Ed's house. It was an old and massive house that was originally a plantation house. Dave described it as looking like a house from a typical horror film. After they went inside, Dave looked in the living room, seeing lots of Bibles, crucifixes, and prayer candles next to a couch. Dave asked, Am I sleeping here? Ed said, No, I sleep here. You can sleep on the floor or in my bedroom, which is upstairs. Dave wanted to sleep upstairs in an actual bed. Now, Ed had apparently gotten to be a very good cook, and while they were eating dinner, Dave met Ed's dog, Bruno. He asked, Where does Bruno sleep? Upstairs. I wish he wouldn't. After dinner, Ed showed Dave the stairs, and Dave asked, Why don't you ever go upstairs? Ed answered, I just don't. This was the first time he seemed annoyed with Dave, as Dave began to walk up the stairs, he thought he heard Ed chanting behind him, and then realized he was praying. He didn't think too much more of it, as he saw Ed's room, and beyond that a second set of stairs leading to the attic behind a very old door. He remembered thinking, if there's a demon in this house, it's gotta be in there. Ed's room was like an octagon with a bed in the middle, and Bruno's bed was next to it. Dave went on to bed. He woke up sometime in the night to hear Bruno softly, half growling, half whining. He also noticed the bedroom door was cracked open, which he thought was strange as he had closed it. He got up to close it and looked at the attic door. It was slowly banging against the latch. He brushed it off as perhaps a draft. As Dave closed the door again, he checked to make sure it was definitely shut. It was also a little colder in the room. But that wasn't surprising as it was the start of spring and an old house, probably with poor insulation, didn't stay heated too well. Dave went to bed a second time. 
This time again, he woke up when Bruno jumped into the bed with him. He was surprised to feel just how cold Bruno was, as well as the room around them. Bruno was shivering. The door to the room was wide open now. Thinking that Ed might be playing a trick on him, he looked all around the room and concluded that there was nowhere to hide. As he got up to close the door once more, he could see his own breath. It had gotten that cold. He also heard the attic door swinging against its latch harder this time. Dave went to bed for a third time. Once more he woke up, not to Bruno though, but to the cold. He guessed it must have been 30 degrees Fahrenheit, when the low at the time was supposed to be about 42 degrees. He heard the attic door now slamming against its hinges, a bang, bang, bang until the door finally burst open. Dave could hear footsteps coming from the attic, and scarier, it sounded like chains rattling. He heard something walk past his door, then stop at the top of the stairs, not going down. It was now near 20 degrees, and Dave was freezing cold. He began to look around the room, noticing a big, humanoid shadow in one of the corners of the room. It wasn't there before. He threw the covers over his head as we all do, because everyone knows that demons can't get you under the blankets. He was holding Bruno into his chest now, beginning a prayer. He'd been on the fence about his faith until then. He realized that if demons were real, so was God. Dave found peace in his prayer. Even though he could feel it getting colder and colder, which meant the shadow was getting closer, for some strange reason he fell asleep then, for the fourth and final time. When Dave woke up, the sun was rising. He grabbed his things and ran downstairs to find Ed already awake making coffee. He turned around with a sad expression on his face. You believe me now? Ed moved out of that house later that year. Afterwards, it seemed to always be up for sale and would become the house that teenagers would dare each other to touch the doorknob of. One day, Dave drove by that house with some friends and said, I slept in that house one night. His friends replied, no, you didn't. Dave never argued past that because it wasn't worth it. Two years after Ed moved out, the house was torn down and a couple of apartments were built there. Dave drove by those apartments once with my teacher, who was his son, and saw a shadow person standing just outside one of them. That specific complex was being renovated at the time, so no lights were on. This scared Dave enough to never come back. Something is wrong with me. From Dead Wolf. Ever since I was little, very strange things have happened around me and to me. Horrifying visions, nightmares, mysterious injuries and illnesses, even my appearance altering greatly. But the event that started it all was when I was about six years old. I had a very bad nightmare. This nightmare was not something any child, especially one so young, should ever have, and to this day I don't know what caused it. The nightmare felt far too real. In it, I awoke in a burned-out cabin-like building in a town consisting of a few simple wooden plank-like cabins. The one I was in was more or less a one-room home, with a kitchenette, fireplace, table, and chairs. This woman claiming to be my mother, made me sit down to feed me. But I knew she wasn't my mother. Yet, no matter how much I told her that, she refused to listen and told me to eat. Reluctantly, I began to eat the stew she set in front of me. But it tasted awful, and it made me want to puke. Looking down at the so-called stew was a bowl of blood filled with human body parts, Tongues, ears, eyes, even fingers. I was horrified and ran away from the fake mother. I ran out into the streets, but the streets were filled with blood and bodies. Looking around, I saw people acting as if all this was normal. 
The town itself was surrounded by a forest burning bright from a red fire, and the only safe path leading to an iron gate was blocked by what appeared to be a wall of human flesh and remains. The people, mostly men, kept telling me if I wished to get out, I had to eat my way through, eat my way through the bodies. I screamed and cried and begged them all to release me. I began to claw my way over the mound of bodies, and I ran for the gate to escape. It was then that I awoke to my actual bed, soaked in sweat and tears covering my face. For over a month, I kept seeing images of bodies every time I closed my eyes to sleep. I spent most of this month sleeping with my parents out of fear of that nightmare. But I was too scared to tell them what the nightmare was of. That was only the beginning to the horrors. A peculiar thing did happen later. I would finally tell my mother about the nightmare. But then she told me how, about two years prior, she took my sister and I to a very old-timey village with such buildings, like the ones from my nightmare. She told me how, while looking at the buildings, I stopped, looked her in the eyes, and said something along the lines of, I know this place. I've been here before. Which isn't possible, since she would have known. That's not all. I began to wake up covered in bruises and scratches. My light brown, nearly blonde hair began to turn a much darker shade, to the point it was nearly black. My tan skin paled to an almost sickly white, and my bright eyes darkened. Almost every night I would see shadows, spirit-like visions, and had even more hellish dreams. Years passed, and my luck got worse, as did my health. I ended up losing my right eye in an accident, and two years ago became deathly ill, coming close to dying. I can't help but think, all of this is related to that nightmare. The Crawling Girl from Kerushi I was about seven or eight years old when my family moved to a homeless shelter for reasons I don't want to get into. We stayed in a room that had three bunk beds and a king-sized bed. The reason our room was so big was because there was nine of us they pretty much had to give us the biggest room in the old Victorian-style house. The very first night, my siblings and I began getting bad nightmares, and eventually we all crawled into bed with our mom and dad. This continued for as long as we stayed there, but eventually we got used to the bad dreams. One night after waking up from an extremely bad nightmare, I ran to my mom and dad's bed. Crawling in with them, there was already three of my siblings there, so it was difficult to find a good spot. Eventually, I got somewhat comfortable. I sat there in the dark as the lights had to be out at 10, and the TVs weren't allowed because of the noise. Suddenly, I began to hear this squelching noise, like bones cracking. I looked into the nearby closet, which sat near the door of our room, and I nearly had a heart attack. What I saw looked like a girl with short hair and a nightgown. She was crawling towards the bed. I screamed as she got closer. My mom and dad sat right up in the bed, one of them turning on the little lamp next to the bed. I told them what I saw. My dad went over to the closet to check it out, but nothing was there, nor did anyone get into our room. My mother told this story to the people of the homeless shelter the next day. I was listening in on the conversation when I heard something that made my jaw drop. Apparently, the closet in our room led to the attic, and about two years prior to us coming there, a woman had gone up in the attic and shot herself in the head. They even apparently had a picture of her. Sure enough, she looked exactly like the woman who was crawling across the floor towards me. I don't understand why her presence was so sinister. After all, they said in life she was a good woman. Maybe she was trapped there by something else. Maybe the way she died made her spirit look so grotesque. After that encounter with her, 
I never saw her again, although the nightmare still continued until we left that place. I'm 24 now, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I swear I'll never forget the crawling girl. The Burned Girl From Beagle Brigade 516 Growing up, I've always believed in spirits or ghosts. We would have unexplainable things happen every now and then, but I never did expect to actually experience something directly. I grew up in extreme poverty, and when I ventured out into adulthood on my own, I worked hard to buy my own property with an old trailer house on it. I was so proud of this home. We worked to remodel it and create a comfy place for our son, who was about two years old at the time. It was nothing fancy, but it was mine. Shortly after moving in, strange things began happening. Things we convinced ourselves were nothing more than our imagination tricking us. For example, we would find cupboards open or things moved, especially my son's toys. One day, my sister was making lunch, and each time she would go back into the kitchen to check on the meal's progress, the stove would be shut off. The first time, we thought maybe she bumped into it when she left, but the third time, we were very confused. My sister was what you would call a spiritual person. Speaking out loud, she said, Please leave the stove on. We will watch it. And as if something out there was listening, the stove stayed on this time for the rest of the meal. Being curious, I asked her why she said that. In response, she told me that she had been seeing a young girl around the age of seven to nine in a white dress who looked as if she was from the settler period. I inquired on when she had seen this girl and how many times. She informed me that it was several times since we moved in, but she wasn't worried about the girl, so she didn't really say anything until now. As time went on, the little girl made her presence more and more known, but there was no harm, so we didn't mind her hanging around. A few months later, my son began to not want to sleep in his own room. He would scream and yell and fight each time we'd lay him in there. This behavior began to intensify to the point that he wasn't sleeping well, and we were very frustrated. Little did I know at the time, this was more than a boy who was just fighting sleeping alone. I had a discussion with my cousin who's also very in tune with the afterlife. She can speak to spirits and deliver messages. We were chatting and I told her about my little girl, and we ended up talking about the challenges I had with my son sleeping alone. He'd gotten so bad that even if we let him fall asleep and moved him to his room, he would scream the moment he woke up until we retrieved him. It was like he was frozen in fear. She suggested we use the video camera I'd recently purchased, set it up in his room, and just let it record. The camera was state-of-the-art for the time, so we placed a fresh VHS tape in the camera and set it to record one night, while we were all in the living room watching TV and hanging out. My sister was there that night. A few hours later, my son fell asleep in the living room, so we took him to his bed and returned with the camera to watch the video recording. Now, this was recording in a pitch black room. We were really interested to see if anything happened that we were not aware of. The first hour or so, the video was silent. All you could hear was the distant laughing and voices of us in the living room. Then suddenly, there was a very loud pop noise on the recording. The best way to describe it is to say it sounded like the noise when someone pops their finger along their cheek inside of their mouth and pops it out. Very childlike, and instantly the hair on my body stood up. I get chills writing this as I can remember that noise like I had just heard it yesterday instead of 20 years ago. Soon the room became active. What was once a solid black room lit up with my son's toys and noises began to play from them. His fire truck lights and sirens lit up the room. Any toy that could light up and make sounds lit that room up like Christmas. We could hear a quiet giggling and a creepy low volume humming in the camera. This humming continued for what seemed like forever in an unrecognizable sing-song type. We all just stared at the screen, 
frozen in fear as we watched this situation unfold. By this point, I was shaking and yelled for my sister to grab my son out of his room right away. In total, we watched less than two minutes of the video after the activity began, but it felt like hours. We both leapt up and grabbed my son. That night, we all slept in the living room. I invited my cousin over to help us the next day, and although she had never been at my new home, she immediately told me we had a little girl who was with us. But it wasn't just her. Her father was apparently here too. She went on to talk to the spirits, and the little girl had lived on the land over 150 years prior. She perished in a fire on the property, and her father passed trying to save her from the flames. He remained with her after death, stuck in the afterlife. I hadn't mentioned the stove incidents to my cousin, but something she said made my skin crawl. Casually, she mentioned that the little girl told her she didn't like it when we used fire in the house, that fire inside the house wasn't safe, and she wanted us to stop doing it. My cousin helped the little girl and her father move along to the next steps of the afterlife, encouraging them towards the light, so to speak. The very next night, my son slept in his room all alone, without any fight, going to bed on his own. To this day, I do not believe she meant any harm to my family or my son specifically. I believe she was excited to have a friend to play with. My cousin believed that he was afraid of the father as he appeared to hover above the ground and simply watch the little girl, but not saying a word to her. I did some research on the land and I was able to find a story of a little girl and father who did perish in a fire around the time frame my cousin had stated. The newspaper story was exactly as she had described it. The father attempted to save his daughter, but unfortunately they had both succumbed to the fire. I have had other encounters with ghosts since then, but nothing has caused as much fear as seeing that room light up while hearing the sing-song humming and giggling from an otherwise empty room. Home Sweet Haunted Home on 63 Maple Street This is an excerpt of a book sent to me by the authors, Jordan Tyler and Quinn Farkas. If you enjoy what you hear, please support them by checking out their book on Amazon called The Haunting of 63 Maple Street. I already ordered myself a copy, actually. Link in the description. Please note I've edited this excerpt slightly so that it fits as a single story submission and sounds a bit less like something from the middle of a book. What better place to begin the story of our home than with the lobby? Our lobby is a bit different from other lobbies on the street in shape and size inside and out and we're guessing in regards to its paranormal activity as well. The old man and old woman who built the place had added it to the home as their next to last addition to the house. For that reason, what used to be the largest window in the house, imagine a big square four and a half foot tall by four and a half foot wide window beside the front door to the house, is now situated inside the lobby directly beside a door that leads to our home's living room. This window and living room door, which was the original front door before the lobby was built, are on the opposite end of the lobby from the new front door. This particular area of our home has been a hotbed of paranormal activity. Long before I left the USA and headed to Belizea, my wife told me stories about potential ghosts and things that go bump in the night in the home, many of which were centered around the living room door and that big old window. Shortly after arriving in Croatia and spending quite a bit of time alone writing, while my wife was away at work, I quickly took note of the same sort of strange and unexplainable activity. Granted, most of the activity I became aware of shortly after I first came to Croatia several years ago was not strictly limited to the lobby. However, many of the first encounters and strange happenings did indeed involve the lobby. Just as my wife had described to me during our constant hours-long Facebook messenger phone conversations, Odd sounds from the lobby disturbed and distracted me from my work as I sat writing at a desk situated against a wall of the living room, which is adjacent to the interior lobby wall, the wall with the door and window in it. Things would randomly fall over, such as a broom or coat rack, or tumble off of the window ledges. There are three large windows on the exterior wall of the lobby, 
that look out onto the yard and crash onto the floor. Loud bangs from the lobby also caught my attention and left me a little nervous as I was the only one home when much of this happened in the beginning. One winter evening in 2018, I was home alone and writing as usual at the desk by the window, which looks out into the lobby from our living room. I was startled by a sudden series of bangs on the other side of the wall. I knew immediately these sounds were different and not simply a broom falling over or a set of keys dropping from the window ledge. This bang sounded hard and loud, like a deliberate donkey kick against a piece of furniture. Stepping outside, I quickly noted that the sounds had obviously come from inside the large wardrobe that sits against the interior wall of the lobby. There was nothing else in the lobby, furniture-wise, that could have accounted for such sounds. I quietly stepped back inside the living room, retrieving a staff that I kept tucked in the corner of the room beside a bookshelf, and silently slid back out into the lobby and crept up to the wardrobe on tiptoes so as to not make any noise to alert whatever may be inside. At this point, I was just beginning to adjust to the house, so my rational brain was telling me that a wild animal must have somehow gained access to the lobby and trapped itself in the wardrobe. Stopping beside the first of the three doors to the wardrobe, I slid the first panel door open with one hand. The other hand gripped the staff. I was unsure of what type of species it could be as I was still fresh off the boat to Europe from the United States. When the door slid open, the compartment was empty, aside from shoes and coats. I repeated the process and found the rest of the large wardrobe was equally empty. Nothing seemed to be out of place. There was definitely nothing inside that I noticed which could account for such sharp and loud banging. Not long after the incident, the wife and I were relaxing in the living room one night and experienced the same sort of sound, loud and deliberate sounding banging from the inside of that wardrobe. Of course, we checked it, and again, there was nothing inside to account for those sounds. No animals, no crashed coat rack or boots that had fallen off the top shelf, there was simply no explanation for it that we could conceive of by any stretch of the imagination, unless it was something paranormal, which began to make more and more sense as time went on. During this same time period, other strange and unexplainable sounds continually disturbed me while I was home alone writing. The lobby was definitely full of mysterious and creepy activity. As I sat at the desk, banging out thousands of words day in and day out, my ears picked up on all sorts of eerie happenings in and around the lobby. One of the most unnerving repeat occurrences from the lobby in those days was the opening and closing of the front door, apparently of its own accord. I didn't even stop writing the first time or two I heard these particular sounds, like the door swinging open and a second later about the time needed for a person to step through the entryway and into the lobby, the door shutting with an audible thud as if it had been pushed closed. I did, however, take notice when a minute later, no one had walked past the big interior window or come through the living room door. It was after the second or third time that I heard the door opening and closing on its own that I started getting up and stepping into the lobby whenever the door opened. Most of the time, it was of course my wife returning from work, but there were several occasions that, upon hearing the door open and close, I stood up to investigate and by the time I opened the living room door that leads to the lobby and stepped out, the space was empty. These experiences continue to this day. In fact, over the past couple of years, the other two doors connected to the lobby, the back door and the living room door, have begun opening and closing by themselves as well. To be absolutely clear, there is no way that the wind is the culprit. These are not old doors, having been installed just a few short years ago and are quite modern, including tight weatherproof seals and solid latches. Another compounding factor that makes things even more nerve-wracking is the accompanying footsteps that can be clearly heard with the opening and closing of the lobby doors. Just one week ago, a few days before Christmas of 2020, I was again home alone and heard the door open and close, as well as the unmistakable sound of footsteps. The sound of someone stepping through the doorway and into the lobby was so clear that I was positive my wife had come home early or that our daughter may have decided to visit unannounced. 
I was, of course, busy writing and didn't even look. When a full minute passed and no one had yet exited from the lobby and entered the living room, I looked up from the computer and looked at the clock before stepping out into the hall. It was still several hours before my wife was expected to be home. The lobby was empty. I stepped outside into the terrace connected to the backside of the lobby and had a look around, but there was nothing to see. I walked back into the lobby and to the front door, stepping outside onto the front stairs. I looked around in the yard and towards the street, but there was no one around. Aside from sounds, we've also had paranormal sightings in the lobby from time to time. My first sightings in the lobby of this house date back to the winter of 2017 and 2018. Again, I was sitting at the desk, writing when it happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed movement. Not some little flicker or blur, like floaters, but something big and well-defined, like an adult person. To be more precise, an adult female with long flowing hair of a much lighter shade than that of my wife or daughter, who both have dark brown hair that appears as black as mine does. This woman's hair color was a mixture of strawberry blonde, which has a slight tinge of orange or red to it, and dirty blonde. I was taken aback the first time I saw her, but with each passing sighting of her, I became less unsettled because I felt nothing threatening about her presence. Discussing these encounters with my wife, who had also witnessed similar manifestations, we became convinced that it may be the spirit of a deceased acquaintance of my wife. If it was her, she had died a sudden and unexpected death due to a very unfortunate accident at home. The circumstances of the girl's death, which had occurred several years ago when she was a teenager, were enough to explain why she might be restless. Out of respect for her family, we won't go further into the details surrounding her death but I will say that some may say that her death was rather suspicious and untimely. Further, prior to her death, her relationship with my wife would also explain why she might want to visit our home in particular. They hadn't been friends for too awfully long before the accident, but they had developed a mutual respect and genuine friendship, which apparently for this girl, real friends were not so easy to come by. The first few times I saw the girl's ghost, she was walking by the big lobby window, and I had a side view of her face. It was from the depiction of what she looked like that my wife was able to put two and two together as to who this ghost might be. After being visited by the girl multiple times, always walking from the front door past the window, one day she continued on to the living room door and stopped with her face peering into the living room through the glass panes in the door. Needless to say, the sight gave me the chills. Thankfully, they passed quickly. We saw her several more times that winter, through the window as well as through the living room door's glass. Eventually, we decided to perform a ritual designed to greet, welcome, and release her spirit. If it were her, and she was indeed trapped here, distraught over her early demise and hoping to be comforted by her old friend, my wife, then we'd do our best to see that she would at last have a bit of peace and rest. That said, it must have worked, because her ghost has not been seen again, that we know of. In addition to the above-mentioned experiences, shadow figures passing by the windows and doors of the lobby and unplaceable noises are often observed by my wife, and by me as well. These occurrences take place mostly at night, and happen on almost a nightly basis, Needless to say, we've become more than used to the level of creepiness that our home exudes. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, 
If you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to eeriecast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.